Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this wonderful event, which will start in just a couple minutes. I wrote an entire intro and left out myself, which is a terrible thing to do. My name's Terry Tazioli. I'm with University Bookstore, and we're bringing you this great event tonight. So, um, at, you know, I thought I need a clever way to get into, like, an intro, which I couldn't think of. All I could say was, you know, as the airlines say, we know you have a choice. So thank you for being with University Bookstore tonight for this event with Scott Kelly and Andrew McIntosh. We appreciate it a lot. The University Bookstore, in case you don't know, is the biggest and the oldest in Washington State. We do, or we're involved in, I should say, hundreds of author and book events every year. So we very much appreciate you coming out and, and being with us. Come back anytime. There's still seats up there. Those people are actually sitting up in space. So, hi. <laughs> Those are my friends. This evening, as I said, we're proud to welcome both Scott Kelly and Andrew McIntosh. And I'm going to bring them up in just a moment, but first let me tell you a little bit about these guys. Scott Kelly is a retired U.S. Navy captain and a former military and test pilot. He's done a couple other things as well. You know, like he's a veteran of four space flights. He was in command of the International Space Station on three of those flights, including a year-long stretch, which is in the book. And he set records for accumulated days in space and the longest space mission by any American. And he has a book, Endurance. There's another book, by the way, too, on our, one of our tables out in the, in the lobby on your way out. It's, he's done a, a kid's book. And it's called My Journey to the Stars. So, you know, if there's a kid around, or buy one for me, that would be fine, too. That's kind of what I am anyway. One thing I want to make sure, at least I hope he answers, and somebody's got to ask it if he doesn't, what does space smell like? If you've read the book, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, got to watch for it. He's joined by Andrew McIntosh, who covers aerospace for the Puget Sound Business Journal in Seattle. And I like this. Here's how Andrew opened a story he wrote when he first became a Puget Sound Business Journal staffer in 2016. I needed a place to land. The Puget Sound Business Journal had an exciting runway available. You notice the kind of the aerospace aeronautical theme going on here? So here I am, your new aerospace beat man in Jet City. And frankly, I think the Puget Sound Business Journal has landed a good one. He's worked at the Sacramento California Bee, and he's a three-time winner of Canada's National Newspaper Award, its highest journalism honor having worked for Canada's National Post and the Globe and Mail, among other news organizations. Oh, you know, he also plays hockey twice a week, or more. And he was once an Air Canada super elite member and flew over 100,000 miles a year for who knows how many years. So I kind of think that qualifies him as a, as a space guy. So, they will be here in a minute. Before I bring them out, we have a video to show you. Be right back. Doing uh, pretty good. I do 
Ladies and gentlemen, would you please help me welcome Scott Kelly and Andrew McIntosh. Hello, hello. Can you hear me at the back of the room? Yeah. Terrific, terrific. So, I'm Andrew McIntosh, and I think you know this other guy. <laughs> we kind of live in an era of uh, what we call in my business five things journalism. And uh, though I'm not a fan of that formula, uh, it's still a great way to distill some of the most fascinating things I read in a book of almost 400 pages. Scott Kelly talked about how he was amazed when he was up in space about how people became obsessed with the more mundane aspects of life up there. And I have to say that the way you laid it out in your book, Scott, it was hard not to be so uh, amazed and so intrigued. So before I let Scott talk, um, I thought I would give you uh, maybe a little five fascinating things that I learned in, in endurance. One, you can be the star astronaut in a billion dollar space program and still lose your internet connection in space on the weekend <laughs> and still not get, you could be a billion dollar, uh, 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 you could be a star astronaut in a billion dollar space program and still lose your internet connection on the weekend and not be able to get a techie to repair it, just like us with Frontier and Comcast. <laughs> Russian and American astronauts uh, do their pre-takeoff enemas, yes, that's a thing, uh, in very different ways, but so soon after dinner, I'll spare you the details. Um, astronauts transport very large quantities of food up to, up to uh, the space station, and they keep track of it using barcodes, much the way we sh shop at Fred Meyer or uh, Safeway. Louder. Louder still? All right. Scott Kelly was perhaps the first person, and I'm not sure about this, but I'm saying perhaps, the first person to calendar a meeting or an event from space using his uh, digital tools up there which is, to me, kind of interesting. But last thing, the, the, the last thing I want to say about him is that Scott Kelly will continue to be a test subject for the rest of his life. And it's bad enough for us reporters to get worked over by editors every day in our newsrooms, but having a, a, a bunch of doctors from NASA poke and prod you forever sounds like a little, uh, quite a sacrifice to make. So. Um, to the man who has spent uh, three Christmas Eves in space, we thank you for your visit to Seattle, but we especially thank you for your service to space, to science, and to this country. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be here, um, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, after a year in space, it's great to be anywhere with gravity. 
And on that space station, I changed positions so many times, you would have thought I was running for president. <laughs> So, to those of you in the audience that do not appear to be space aliens, I'd like to say good evening. And to the rest of you, I come in peace. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to apologize for that video. That was, well, it wasn't really a video. It was supposed to be a video, but it didn't work like it was supposed to. That's why it didn't seem to make sense. <laughs> at some point, I'll put it on my website so folks can get a look at what they were going to see. What I'd like to do first is uh, read from my new book, Endurance, so you can hear it in my own voice. I'm just going to read for a few minutes, and that way you don't have to buy the audio book. <laughs> I know these books are expensive. I'm going to start at the uh, beginning of the story, which actually starts at the end of my experience in space for a year. It's right after I got home. The prologue starts with, I'm sitting at the head of my dining room table at home in Houston, finishing dinner with my family, my longtime girlfriend Amiko, now my fiance over here, my daughters Samantha and Charlotte, my twin brother Mark, his wife Gabby, his daughter Claudia, our father Richie, and Amiko's son Corbin. It's a simple thing sitting at a table and eating a meal with those you love, and many people do it every day without giving it much thought. For me, it's something I've been dreaming of for almost a year. I contemplated what it would be like to eat this meal so many times. Now that I'm finally here, it doesn't seem entirely real. The faces of the people I love that I haven't seen for so long, the chatter of many people talking together, the clink of silverware, the swish of wine in a glass, these are all unfamiliar. Even the sensation of gravity holding in my chair feels strange. And every time I put a glass or a fork down on the table, there's a part of my mind that is looking for a dot of Velcro or a strip of duct tape to hold it in place. I've been back on Earth for 48 hours. I push back from the table and struggle to stand up, feeling like an old man getting out of a recliner. Stick a fork in me. I'm done, I announce. Everyone laughs and encourages me to go get some rest. So I shuffle off to bed for a few hours, waking several hours later with flu-like symptoms. All right, technical difficulty here. Sorry about that. My phone was ringing. It rings a lot. I don't make those kind of mistakes in space. I wonder who that was, by the way. No one important. I struggle to get up, find the edge of the bed, feet down, sit up, stand up. At every stage, I feel like I'm fighting through quicksand. When I'm finally vertical, the pain in my legs is awful. And on top of that pain, I feel something even more alarming. All the blood in my body is rushing to my legs, like the sensation of the blood rushing to your head when you do a headstand, but in reverse. I can feel the tissue in my legs swelling. I shuffle my way to the bathroom, moving my weight from one foot to the other with deliberate effort, left, right, left, right. I make it to the bathroom, flip on the light, and look down at my legs. They are swollen and alien stumps, not legs at all. Are there kids in here? Kids? Earmuffs. <laughs> oh shit, <laughs> I say. Amiko, come look at this. She kneels down and squeezes one ankle and it squishes like a water balloon. She looks up at me with worried eyes. I can't even feel your ankle bones, she says. Then there's 400 more pages after that. And I can assure you that each and every other page that he hasn't read is as equally as huh. riveting. So there's, it's just chock full of stuff. But I thought that most people would want to hear, um, how, how did you become an astronaut, Scott? So I am not the, the uh, typical guy that uh, gets to work at NASA as an astronaut because 
I came from a, uh, a beginning where I was not a particularly good student. And uh, I know that's opposite what people think of astronauts. They think, oh, that guy must have been the smartest kid in the class, the overachiever. And I was the exact opposite of that. I spent more time looking out the window or looking at the clock, trying to will it to run faster when I was in school than I ever did paying attention. It was absolutely impossible. And for kids out there, don't uh, you know, go home tonight and think, well, I'm not going to pay attention in school because he didn't. Because <laughs> that is not an easy uh, place to recover from. Plus, you waste a lot of time. And I basically you know, wasted the first 18 years of my life sitting in school and not learning much of anything because I couldn't pay attention. If I was a kid today, I think I'd be diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. And I graduated from high school in the bottom half of my class. And I went to college because that was expected of me. But I, I went to the wrong school. Now, I don't mean I went to this school over here thinking that this one over here was a better fit for me. What I mean is I applied to and showed up at this college thinking I was going to this one over here. <laughs> I'm quite possibly the only person that has ever done this. <laughs> and I get to my, and I get to college, I'm there for a few days, and I'm like, hey, when's the football game? And the person says, well, we don't have a football team. That's that other school in Maryland. And I was basically doing the same thing I did in, you know, my first 18 years of my education. I couldn't pay attention, couldn't study, wasn't learning anything, wasn't doing well. Eventually, I'm not even going to class much. And then walking across the college campus one day, and I happened to walk into the bookstore to buy, not to buy a book, <laughs> to buy like gum or something. <laughs> but I go into the bookstore, and I see this book on the end of the aisle on the end cap, I think they call it. It's got this red, white, and blue cover. It had a, not this book, but it had a red, white, and blue cover. And it had a really cool title, made me pick it up. I read the back, and I opened it up, and I started paging through it. And was interested enough in what it had to say that I took my gum money, uh, took it back to my dorm room, ra laid there over the next few days on my unmade dorm room bed, and read the stories of the fighter pilots that became the test pilots that became the original Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts. The book was The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe. And the way Tom wrote this book in his creative nonfiction way, you know, using his you know, imagination a little bit to make uh, it seem very real, I was able to connect with it. And I recognized that these guys in this book, I felt like they were a lot like I was, with one exception. And that was that I was not a good student. And I thought, you know, how cool that was, what they were doing. Um, I wanted to do that too. And I felt like, you know, if I could solve this one problem of not being able to pay attention and study, maybe I could be an astronaut someday. So I did one of the hardest things I ever had to do, and that was teach myself how to pay attention. But eventually, you know, it worked and it paid off. And fast forward from that time when I was 18, 18 years later, with inspiration that I got from a book, I was the first American astronaut in my class of 35 people to fly in space. And I think back to that and I'm like, and I, I actually never really even thought much about it until I was writing this book, thinking, wow, what a, what a remarkable comeback that was. And it started uh, in the pages of the book, The Right Stuff. Now, when you were up there in space for a year, you uh, paid an unusual tribute to Mr. Wolf um, and sucked up some pretty good writing tips, I hear. Uh, how did that happen? Um, so, uh, on this last flight, uh, I, I've actually flown in space three times previously, but on this long uh, flight towards the end of my, uh, my space flight, um, yeah, I just got Tom Wolfe's email, sent him an email, told him how much his book had meant to me, and then um, later I talked to him on the phone, and he... Uh, how cool is that? Yeah. And, uh, you know, he... We just chit-chatted about the book and flying in space, and, you know, we did talk a little bit. Um, actually, it was later that we 
you know, when I met him after I got back that we talked about writing when he knew I was uh, thinking about writing a book. Now, in, in your book, you talk about the smells inside the space station. And a lot of us may have seen what it looks like in there, and you saw some of the videos, but none of us could actually be there and smell what it, you smelled. So take us there. Describe what you smelled when, while you were up there. So, um, you know, you know, when you write a book, you want to make it very visual and allow the people to uh, try to, you know, be in the moment. And the way you do that is, you know, with sight, with senses. You know, sight, sound, smells. So, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, discuss what the space station smells like, which is um, kind of a cross between um, garbage and um, an antiseptic smell, like cleaners. Um, I actually went on a tour of the Harris County Jail in, in Houston, Texas a few years ago, and we walk into this room that had housed like uh, 40 prisoners, and I got this like deja vu. I'm like, <laughs> man, this place smells just like the space station. <laughs> But, you know, there are other smells in space. There's the smell of space. And people talk about the smell of space. I talk about how sm space smells. Well, you know, actually, it's not really the smell of nothing, right? Nothing can't have a smell. But when you have a, a, a volume of air um, that that space was just recently at vacuum, the smell it has is, and it comes from the material that was at vacuum, the outside of the space station, the inside of the airlock, it smells like burning metal or maybe how a uh, sparkler might smell on the 4th of July. That's kind of how space uh, smells to me. You write um, about the damage and changes to your vision that you experienced during your flights. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell people about those and what they might mean for the uh, future, very long-term missions of, to Mars. Yeah, so, um, you know, when we go to space, there's um, a lot of physical effects that occur on our bodies in microgravity in this stressful, harsh environment, a lot of radiation. There's a lot of things that happen to us. It's kind of a negative effect mostly a negative effect of being in space. Um, we lose bone mass at a rate of 1% a month. So if you, if you didn't do anything, after 100 months, we would have no skeleton. Be like all invertebrates, like big sacks of flesh and organs. Be like Gumby, maybe. Gumby. And uh, you lose bone mass, you lose muscle mass. There's uh, the effects of radiation on us at a genetic level, on our DNA. That's why we did this study with my brother and I, this uh, twin study, where we compared him and I on a, a genetic level. He was the control on the ground and I was up in space. And like you were saying, there's also this effects on our vision, structural changes in our eyes that occur that we don't quite understand, but that's one of the reasons why we are, you know, spending more time in space. So when we go to Mars, we're not going to have crew members that are trying to land and can't see. There's actually some good things that, that happen physically when you're in space for a long time. Um, actually, there's one good thing, I think. <laughs> I can only think of one good thing. And that is, um, when you don't use your feet, all the calluses kind of fall off of them <laughs> over the course of like a, uh, a few months. It's a little disgusting when you take your socks off and you get this big cloud of <laughs> You don't never want to take your socks off in, in the presence of another crew member. But after a few months, you have baby feet. And after my, uh, my not my year-long flight, but the six-month flight I did previous to that, after that mission, I get home, and it was no one knew I was up in space, and I go get a massage at one of these massage places. And the, uh, you know, at the end of the massage, they rub your feet. And this woman's rubbing my feet, and she's like, you have the softest feet I've ever felt <laughs> my entire life. All I said to her was, thank you. I'm very proud of them. And then I left. She's probably still talking about the guy with the baby feet five years later. 
Now, in a, in a time where we have a situation with Russian intelligence uh, accused of interfering and trying to influence our elections here, your book describes, with great emotion and passion actually, uh, how your mission was a success because of the cooperation and friendship uh, with your fellow Russian astronauts and others from other countries, but specifically the Russians. And I'm wondering what we could learn from your experiences to uh, perhaps improve our relationships here on Earth. You know, one of the great things about the, uh, the space station program is that it is the International Space Station. And it allows us to do something very complicated, something very risky, something very expensive. Do it with this international partnership of 15 countries. You, you know, you're, you're spreading the cost, you're spreading the, uh, the risk a little bit. Um, but you're also um, creating a team that has people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of diversity. And I've always found, um, especially after working at NASA, that diversity is incredibly important. You know, people from different cultures, different races, even, you know, different sexual orientation, you know, whatever that diversity is, provides for um, a team that has different perspectives, which gives it strength, knowing how to look at problems and things in a different way. And part of that is this international, um, you know, agreements and cooperation in space, particularly with the Russians, and people are often interested hey, you know, our countries don't necessarily always get along. We used to be in, in a Cold War. Uh, we are often in conflict now. How does it, that affect your ability to work together in space? And I have to say, it doesn't affect it at all, surprisingly. You know, we are friends, we are colleagues, we help each other, we have to rely on one another, in some cases literally for our lives, and that transcends any political uh, discourse we may have on the ground, believe it or not. Um, my colleague Misha Kornienko, Mikhail Kornienko, the guy I spent a year in space with, the Russian, uh, Russian cosmonaut, he would, uh, he said a couple of times uh, when we were on board the space station, he said, you know, Scott, if, if our co two countries want to solve their conflicts, all we, should, all we have to do is send our two presidents to space for a whole year. <laughs> and we would... That's all we have to do. But it, was all, it wasn't all hugs and vodka shots up there, though. Apparently, you guys and uh, the Russians disagreed about air samples and the Dis quality thereof and whose were better, who's, who had better measurements than the other? Of what? The air samples in the capsule. Air samples in the capsule. It's a very big detail in the book that I kind of jumped out at me. It was sort of amusing because everything, they're getting along so well up there, but nobody, they didn't like or respect the quality of each other's air samples. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're getting down in the weeds. Yeah, I'm in the weeds. <laughs> That's what, you want to hear about launching on a rocket <laughs> instead of air samples? Yeah. How about that? My, ne my next question was, what's it like to walk in space? Okay, that's better. <laughs> so doing a spacewalk surprisingly, isn't really that much fun. It's a type two kind of fun. It's fun when it's done. Type one fun, that's the roller coaster. Type two kind of fun, spacewalk. Maybe climbing Mount Everest. Very physical. I mean, it's very emotional. I mean, the first time you open a hatch, I, I, I had never done a spacewalk before, and the first time I, I did one was on this last flight. And uh, the guy I was with, he didn't do one either, so I got to go outside first, neither of us having ever gone outside before. And you open the hatch, I didn't even know if it was going to be day or night. I really didn't care. I was hoping it would be day, but it wasn't that important to me because there were so many other things that are important, like, you know, not messing up your tethers and floating away. <laughs> and you open up the hatch and you see the earth 250 miles down below, and you're going 17,500 miles an hour. And the, the airlock hatch is on the floor of the airlock, so the earth is right down there. You come out, or I came out head first. The first guy to come out comes out head first, the other guy feet first. I come out head first, and initially I feel like I'm kind of climbing down, and then as I get halfway out of the airlock, all of a sudden my, my uh, like reference frame shifts, and now I feel like I'm climbing out of the sunroof of a car. 
And then I look up above me, and there's this giant planet hovering in the sky, which is Earth, but it looked like kind of a science fiction image of this alien planet, like ready to crash down on us, which is pretty distracting, actually, <laughs> when, you're, when you're trying to do all this work. And uh, yeah, it was like something out of a sci-fi novel, but you know, eventually you get, you get, um, you know, outside and you, you get a little bit acclimated and you, then you get to work. There was another time on a spacewalk where, I actually got, spacewalk where I actually got lost on the outside of the space station. Yeah, you, you would think this would not be possible. <laughs> it is possible. You know, it gets dark, you know, when the sun uh, goes down uh, for about 45 minutes and uh, you have lights on your spacesuit, but all you can see is like what's right in front of you. Like if you were doing a like scuba diving, scuba diving in murky waters or at night. And uh, yeah, I was lost for probably about 10 or 15 minutes. Didn't know where I was. Um, almost kind of gave up for what I was trying to do and you know, tried to find my way back to the airlock. Eventually though, I happened to see some lights in the sky, which I was kind of confusing because um, it wasn't in the sky, it was actually on Earth, and I'm looking up and I can see the distinct outline of the lights on the uh, Persian Gulf and with Abu Dhabi and uh, Dubai, and then I was able to, you know, figure out which way was up and down and, and find my way to where I had to go. One last one from mine, and then we have some questions from you that we'll, uh, we'll toss out there. Um, about two years ago, the space station docked uh, with uh, a rocket and out popped three more people into your very small world, and they brought with them a special dinner um, from down on the ground, uh, but the, the dessert was really extra special. Can you tell us about that? Um, I guess I can tell you. What? It was a chocolate with a poem in it. From who? Who did the poem come from? From Amico. Thank you, Amico, for that poem. And the poem, uh, Scott reproduces the poem in the book, and I would urge you to read it because I, yeah. I thought it was beautiful mm -hmm. and something I would like to get if I was up in space. So. <laughs> now, is there questions that I haven't asked you? This yeah. is a journalism trick. Questions that I haven't asked you that you think I should have asked? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, what's it like to launch on a rocket? <laughs> what's it like to launch on a rocket? It's incredible. <laughs> you know, the first time I flew in space was in 1999, and uh, it was a Hubble t t Space Telescope repair mission. And, um, you know, you think about the fact that this is a risky thing to do before you uh, get ready to fly in space, especially if you've never flown in space before. It's something you really think about. You know, every time I flew in space, I always wrote letters to my loved ones, gave them to my brother, and basically it was like, hey, if I come back, just throw these in the garbage. Seriously. And he'd, he would do the same thing, and other astronauts do that as well. Because it's risky. On the shuttle program, we had two fatal accidents in 140 flights. Which is like if I took a deck, bunch of deck of cards and just threw them out in the audience, everyone who got the ace of spades would die. That's how much risk it is. So you think about this leading up to the flight, but eventually, you know, it's launch day and you're kind of committed. You've rationalized in your mind that this is something you feel strongly about, something you want to do. And you're heading to the launch pad with your fellow crew members. You get out to the space shuttle. It's uh, fully fueled, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen sitting on the launch pad, two uh, giant solid rocket motors. Thing weighs five million pounds. The launch pad is completely abandoned, with the exception of you and your six crewmates and three or four people that help you get strapped in. You get in, in the spacecraft about three and a half hours prior to launch. You get strapped into the seat tight, really tight. You're lying on your back, looking straight up at the sky. I was the pilot sitting in the right seat. <coughs> excuse me, on my first flight. And then the clock starts counting down. During the, that three hours, you're getting all these systems ready for, for, uh, for the launch, uh, electrical system, APUs, which power the hydraulics, 
the main engines, the orbiter maneuvering system engines, the reaction control system engines that control the attitude of the space shuttle in space, environmental control system, computers, all these things, 2,000 switches and circuit breakers in the space shuttle. All these things have to be, you know, ready to go, perfect. Clock gets to nine minutes, it stops. That's to give you to, some time to catch up if you happen to be behind on, on what you're doing. It's also the moment you think to yourself, man, this is really stupid. <laughs> Getting ready to launch into space for the first time. But you can't get away, you're strapped in, the hatch is bolted closed. <laughs> It would look really stupid, too, if you were like the first astronaut to ever run away from the <laughs> rocket. It'd be one of those most embarrassing moments ever. Eventually, the clock starts picking up from nine minutes and gets to a minute, and you're thinking, wow, I'm getting close to this. 30 seconds, and the space shuttle computers take over the launch count. You get to 10 seconds. At six seconds, the main engine's light, giant main engines, a million pounds of thrust, but you don't go anywhere because you're bolted to the launch pad by these eight giant bolts. Then the clock goes five, four, three, two, one. At zero, the bolts are exploded open, the solid rocket motors are lit simultaneously, and it feels like the hand of God has just lifted you off that launch pad and is throwing you out into outer space. And I know, like, if you've seen this on TV or been to Florida for a shuttle launch, it looks like the shuttle lifts off slowly. When you're inside, there is nothing slow about this. <laughs> you get the feeling you're going somewhere, you're not sure where you're going, but you know you're not coming back to Florida. <laughs> At two minutes, the solid rocket motors are exploded off and they go you know, flying out. Feels like almost like all your engines have just cut off and you're kind of falling backwards a little bit. And then you because you were at 2 G's and then you went back to like 1 G and then you slowly accelerate. And as you get towards the end of the eight and a half minute flight into space, you, it's, it's hard to breathe because the G-forces from the engines pushing on your back just are crushing your chest and pulling on the straps of your harness to where it's really, really difficult to breathe. And then after eight and a half minutes, those engines cut off and you're floating around the planet at 17,500 miles an hour. Think about it. I have a few questions from some really special audience members. William, who is age four and draws the most amazing rocket picture, wants to know uh, what do astronauts eat in space? And a related sort of sub-question from Zena, who is seven, and her sister Zoe, 11. What's your favorite food in space? So, um, we have space food, of <laughs> course. You know, some of it is this dehydrated uh, or rehydratable stuff. We don't bring um, a lot of water to the space station because water is very heavy. So, uh, we actually make water uh, from our urine um, through a process which we then drink it, then we turn it into urine again, <laughs> then we drink it again. Actually, we drink it again after we turn it into water. And I know what you're thinking, you know, that guy drank his pee for a whole year. <laughs> Actually, I drank everyone's pee. It's all, it's all mixed together. But it does taste better than the water in Florida. <laughs> tell you that. So, True, true. But so that water we add to the dehydrated food, and it's like mountain home camping food. That's like a third of the food, maybe, you know, maybe like 40% of what you eat is dehydrated. And then there's stuff that's irradiated, which is like MREs that they, the military would have, meals ready to eat. And you would have like a piece of like a hamburger or like beef steak or something that they zap with radiation to kill all the germs. It was funny when I was on the space station this time where I was talking about the radiation that they hit the food with on, a, uh, on a, a, uh, an interview, media interview, and my cosmonaut buddy, he, he's like, there's radiation in this food? <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 we hit it with radiation. He goes, well, how do you know there's no radiation in it? 
And I'm like, Misha, we're getting like 20 chest x-rays a day up here. You don't need to worry about the radiation in the food. And then some of the stuff is stuff that we, we, uh, you could just buy in a grocery store, like a can of, uh, you know, chicken, as an example, or chocolate or things, you know, just off the shelf kind of stuff. My favorite space food was just this simple granola with milk that if I had it in my home and I could just add water to it, I would eat that for breakfast almost every day. Everything else is, um, you know, it's uh, not something I would recommend. <laughs> Surprisingly though, that astronaut ice cream that you might get at like Disney World, urban myth. <laughs> so parents, when your kids start crying that they need the astro astronaut ice cream, Tell them it doesn't exist. <laughs> I have one here from uh, Eva, age six, and Addie, age three. Did you ever get hit by space debris or comets? Yeah, so the space station uh, gets hit by space debris all the time. And when I, there's a lot of space junk out there, so it gets hit by pieces of like flecks of paint, bigger pieces. Um, Sometimes those are micrometeoroids, so something that's coming from outer space, like deep space, hits us. But, you know, generally those things are really small. But on the spacewalk, you can see the damage that the space station has uh, sustained over the 17 years it's been up there. There's actually, like, things that look like bullet holes through handrails, you know, pieces of aluminum that have, you know, like someone shot a gun at it. Normally, if there's something coming at us, we can move the space station out of the way. If you see it in time, like something that could do some significant damage, like something that could penetrate the hull. Um, but when I was up there in the summertime, we had a case where they didn't see a Russian satellite that was coming at us. They didn't see it in time. And it's uh, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, just like we are, but in the exact opposite direction and it's potentially gonna hit us. Um, it's gonna get, definitely get within a mile. They're not sure how close. And um, they have, they didn't see it in time to move the space station. So we have to prepare for this 35,000 mile an hour potential impact. Um, on the US side of the space station, I was, only, I was up there with two Russian guys at the time, just the, the three of us for like six weeks and it was kind of in the middle of that. So, they had me close all 18 or check all 18 hatches on the U.S. side of the space station with the idea being, you know, if we get hit, if the hatch is closed, maybe we'll just lose that one module and the rest of the space station would survive. And then, it, you know, it takes me a few hours to do that. Then I float down to the Russian side of the space station. It's in two halves, and I kind of see something I'll, I'll never forget, and that is, you know, the Russians aren't doing anything to get their side of the space station ready. <laughs> They're having lunch. <laughs> You might wonder, like, why the difference in philosophy? Well, you know, they're, uh, you know, people look at things based on their, you know, your perspective is made based on your, your history, you know, things that you've experienced. And at NASA, we had two fatal accidents that were not failures of hardware. They were really failures of, um, you know, management to do the right thing and try to protect against known risk, even though it had very low probability, but significant implications. And as a result of this failure, you know, 14 astronauts were killed and we lost uh, them and two space shuttles. Um, so NASA does things a little bit different than the Russians. You know, they, the way they look at it is there's two likely possibilities. This thing's either gonna miss us or it's gonna hit us and we'll be vaporized. We won't even know it. But still within we're still gonna go and use the Soyuz maybe as a lifeboat if we get hit, so we get inside the Soyuz with about 10 minutes to go, and we're sitting in there all crouched in there. It's cold, it's dark, it's loud. And Gennady Padalka, the Soyuz commander says, he says, it will really suck if this satellite hits us. <laughs> Misha sitting next to him says, da. <laughs> we'll suck. And I notice Misha looking out the window. I say, Misha, you're not going to see anything. This thing's going 35,000 miles an hour. That's 20 times faster than a bullet from a rifle. You're not going to see anything. And it's dark outside. <laughs> and I notice I'm looking out the window. <laughs> Unless the time gets close to zero where we all start like 
grimacing and, you know, tensing up and holding our breath as if this is going to help us survive this. <laughs> Pretty soon the clock gets to zero and time starts counting up and after about 30 seconds the Russian control center comes on and they say, Gennady Ivanovich, it is safe, you guys can go back to work now. So they go back to lunch. <laughs> I go and spend the rest of the day opening up all these hatches. You have to know that you're in a Microsoft town here in Seattle, so there's a Microsoft-related question. Yes, I have had the blue screen of death in space. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wants to know, how did the HoloLens work up there, and was it useful or usable? I was shocked at how that thing worked, in that it worked incredibly well. You know, I, I went and visited the, uh, the campus before I flew, and we played around with it, but I always had the feeling that maybe there was like a supercomputer running in the back room controlling it. Um, and then it got to space, and I thought, you know, this is uh, the HoloLens. This is like uh, this, this headset that is not virtual reality. It's augmented reality. So, in other words, if I had it on, I could see... Um, all of you people in the, in, the, in the church, but we could put graphics on the uh, display. And the way uh, we used it on the space station, the way we were practicing, uh, we were testing it, was that I could have this on and then have a person on the ground, maybe the expert on a particular system, seeing with cameras exactly what I'm seeing, talking to me in this headset real time, and then the, have them have the ability to write in my field of view and to point at things and maybe circle a bolt or say, no, you know, cross something out and say, no, don't, don't disconnect that connection. <laughs> Do the one over here. And it worked great. I was shocked at how well this thing worked. Really, it was really amazing technology. Cool. People from Microsoft will love that. <laughs> now, last questions. Um, what are your hopes for the future of space, and what kind of advice would you have for young girls, especially in, in this town, who love space and science, but maybe not school just so much right now? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the future of, uh, of space and space flight is whatever we want to make of it, all right? We uh, have an incredible capacity in this country um, with NASA and even our commercial partners. I think with companies like uh, SpaceX and Boeing also is working on a spacecraft, Blue Origin as well. I think we're on the, the cusp of a revolution with uh, having the capability to fly people into space, more people into space at a, at, a, at a lower cost. And I'm very, very excited about that. I think um, our goal should be to go to Mars um, whether we get there or not in my lifetime, I have no idea um, whether that's going to happen. I know it could happen. We have the capability to it, to do that. When I was on the space station, I was asked a question by a reporter, and he said, hey, now that NASA has found uh, liquid water on Mars, we know there's liquid water, sometimes during the year, we can actually see it, um, is that going to help us get to Mars any sooner? And I said, uh, I don't know, maybe. Now if we found money on Mars, <laughs> then we get there real fast. You know, because that's what we need. Um, but really what that means is we need um, you folks to elect people in Congress, in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, in state government that are more science-minded people that... Uh, You know, I'm not, you know, I always find this funny, you know, I'm not a rocket scientist, but if I want to know something about rocket science, I ask a rocket scientist. I don't ask a lawyer or a politician. You know, I'm always shocked when you get people that don't have a science background that don't believe 97% of the scientists that say, hey, you know, this is a real issue like climate change that we have to deal with. So... 
you know, if we want to go to Mars, I think we need, you know, the support of the public and we need to elect people in our government that are more, you know, uh, science oriented and um, people that believe in science versus, you know, a lot of the folks that are uh, deniers of, you know, the truth. And for those young girls who... Uh, uh, young girls. Young girls. You know, um, young girls, young boys, whoever they are. Um, you know, I have two young daughters. I want, I only have two, two daughters. I want them to, you know, do whatever they, uh, you know, dream to do and be as successful as possible. And if we have young girls out there that want to be astronauts, you know, we picked an astronaut class two classes ago that was half men and half women, which is uh, very exciting that we had a 50% split uh, for the first time in history. But for me, becoming an astronaut was, um, you know, started with uh, inspiration that I found in a book. So, but this book is uh, PG-13, so I would suggest that the young kids wait a little while before they read it. There's a few, a few bad words. Remember, I used to be in the Navy. <laughs> Curse like a sailor. A little bit of that in here. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you f and you for your questions. And uh, it was, it's been a fun and interesting and fascinating evening. And we wish you uh, have a great stay. Yeah, thank you. Hey, and let me say one more thing before we, uh, we go. And um, I want to make sure you guys get out of here at a reasonable hour. But I, wa I wanted to leave you with, 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 with one final thought of my... Uh, based on my experience in, in space. And that is, when I was leaving the space station, and keep in mind, this is a space station I've spent 500 days of my life on. Became intimately familiar with it. You know, in some ways learned to like really appreciate and have a, a genuine fondness for this place. And I'm in the Soyuz, and I'm backing away from the station. And I'm looking out my window, which is right here, at the parts I can see, the truss. And I'm thinking about, how we started this, building this program, uh, the space station, in 1998. It's been up there for, you know, 18, 19 years now. And I'm thinking how we built this million-pound structure the size of a football field while flying around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour in a vacuum in extremes of temperatures of plus or minus 270 degrees connecting these modules together, some of which had never touched each other before on Earth. First time they ever t saw each other face to face, it had to be connected to each other, was in space. And put together by astronauts and cosmonauts in these very difficult to use spacesuits in a, uh, a radiation environment that's 20 times, 20 chest x-rays every single day, micrometeoroids, uh, you know, the risk of that hitting us. And we did this with this international partnership of 15 countries, different languages, different cultures, different uh, engineering standards, that this space station is the hardest thing we have ever done. And I was absolutely inspired that if we can do this, we can do anything. If we want to go to Mars, we can go to Mars. If we want to cure cancer and put the resources behind it, we can do that. If we want to fix the problems, that we have with the climate and our environment, we can do that. If we want to, if we want to fix the ch all the challenges we have in this country right now, you know, we can solve those problems. You know, after spending a year in space, I was absolutely inspired that if we can dream it, we can do it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Well done.